Today, while so many of my horror friends are kicking off the start to a horror-filled weekend down in Texas at KillerCon, I'm keeping horror alive here at home with my friend Edmund Stone and book two of his Rebecca mythos called The One. Let's get it started. Hey, thank you for joining me on episode 58 of First Chapter Freak Show. I'm your host, horror author Carver Pike, and we have a great show today. Lots of stuff to talk about. We're definitely going to be talking about Killer Con and reading over Edmund Stone's book, and he's got some great deals for you. We're going to be talking about all kinds of crazy shit today, some cool stuff. So let's go ahead and get started. As usual, housekeeping kind of stuff. Keep the kids out of the room or earplugs in or, you know, whatever. Uh, you know what I mean? Ear pods. Ear, you don't want earplugs in because then you won't fucking hear me. But as you can see, I already dropped an F-bomb, so you probably don't want sensitive ears around. So put your headphones on or your ear pods, <laughs> ear pods or earbuds in, whatever, you know, to make sure my voice is only in your ears or only around people who won't get upset by hearing me. So, you know, off, oftentimes I read extreme horror books because what I do here is I read other authors' books, sometimes my own, but most of the time other authors' books, so that you can discover authors that you may not have read before, and those authors can probably find readers who may not have read their books before, and hopefully you'll go buy their book after hearing me read it and go on to read the rest of their work and stuff like that. That said, after reading the book today. Go check out Edmund's work. Um, look at the look inside. Check the grammar, all that kind of stuff. I try to say that with most of the authors, um, so it's not just Edmund in, in particular, but go check the grammar and writing style and stuff like that. Do your due diligence with all the authors. Make sure that, you know, that you like their style and stuff like that, so that's kind of what we do here. And hopefully you will love his stuff and you'll go on to buy everything he has ever written and everything that he continues to write for the rest of his life. And you'll tell all your friends about him and all your family and you'll put his books in everybody's Christmas stocking and, you know, under everybody's pillows and you'll be putting them in people's cars and shit. You just won't be able to say enough about Edmund Stone after this episode and the books that you've read. That's, it'll just be fucking phenomenal. That's what we hope will happen here. So... Yeah, that's what I do, and that's what you do, because you watch me, and, you know, you guys are so fucking amazing. Um, I think we're up to, I think we might have passed 300 followers. I feel like I might have lost a couple people, because I think we were at really close to 300, and then it was a couple under. I don't know. I don't know what happened. Whatever. It doesn't matter. As long as uh, my followers that keep watching me are still watching, I don't really care. I love doing this. It's fun. I love helping out other authors and, and reading work. You know, I love to read too. I'm a reader and um, this helps me be able to read other authors' work and find the stuff that I enjoy myself. So I'll be reading from my brand new Kindle because I picked up a paper white because to be honest, I'm kind of tired of the Kindle fire. I, I, I bought it thinking, you know, hey, it's kind of like a tablet. It's got all these cool games and shit on it. I can watch Netflix on it and stuff. And it only took a couple months for that to wear off. And then I was like, I don't want this fucking thing. It's too much like a tablet. I don't want to watch Netflix. I don't want to play fucking games. I just want to read books. So, yeah, I got bogged down with all that shit on it. So I really just wanted something to read books on. So I'm much happier with the paper white. I just got it recently and I'm loving it. Just having something to only read books on and not have to sit and wait for it to... It seemed like it took forever to load, man, just to get going. So anyways, yeah. I got this going, so that's what we're reading from today. All right, so let's talk a little bit about KillerCon. Um, that's what's going on this weekend. I, you know, messaged Roland today. Roland Bercy Jr. is one of my good buddies. He's part of the, the Written in Red podcast. He's down there or on his way. I Hopefully he's there already because he had a reading at, I think, 1230 or something like that. So um, hopefully his reading went well. Lucas Mangum is there. He's a good friend of mine. I know Candace Nolo was going down there. Um, a lot of my good friends are there. I wish I could have been there. The plan originally was, and you probably heard me talk about it a long time ago, uh, I did originally book a table and stuff at KillerCon, but I just couldn't swing it this year. There's just too much stuff going on. 
personally in my life and and that's a, a very expensive trip and i just couldn't make it this year hopefully things will be going a little better next year and i'll be able to do that trip because that is one of my big kind of bucket list horror author conventions that i want to do so yeah i couldn't go to that one but i'm there in spirit i wish all the authors luck they're part of the splatterpunks because that is the convention where the splatterpunk awards are announced and my book the maddening is up for best novel with um some amazing brilliant authors uh, i don't know how well i'll do I, my book the maddening is technically fifth in a series so i feel like that's it's kind of tough to have fifth in a series you know up in the battle like that but and the other authors man they're brilliant. Like I said, there's some badass authors. I'm about to show you everybody that's part of the uh, Killer Con experience this year with Splatterpunk Awards. Um, we're going to, I like showing book covers. I love book covers. So we're going to go through all of them. I've collected all the book covers to show you because even on Facebook, you'll see the lists and stuff like that of who was nominated for Splatterpunk, but you might not have seen the actual book covers and all that kind of stuff. So I think it's kind of cool to show them and say a little bit about the authors, or at least the ones that I know, and things like that. So let's go through that right now, because we need to hurry up and get to Edmund's book. Some of you don't have the fucking attention span to watch an hour-long video, I know. Especially with TikToks and stuff now, only 30 minutes to 3 minutes and stuff. It's it's crazy. So let's go through the, the categories right now. Starting out with Best Novel, we have Don't Go to Wheelchair Camp by David Irons. Published by Severed Press. David Irons is awesome. He's such a gentleman, man. He's super cool. He reached out to me recently, and we talked a little bit and stuff like that. He's just such a nice guy. Don't Go to Wheelchair Camp is up for for Splatterpunk Award for him for Best Novel. And I can't wait to read that one. I've heard great things about it. Trench Mouth by Christine Morgan. Published by Madness Heart Press. You know, Trench Mouth, I actually read that here on the on the show and loved it. I haven't had the chance to read the, through the rest of the book, but her style in that book was just so poetic. I loved it, man. Um, I think she has a really good shot at it, too. The Maddening by me. Um, like I said, it's fifth in the series, so you know, hopefully. The Maddening is the book that I worked, I, I would say I worked the hardest on. It's my largest book, and man, it took a lot out of me. It took many years to write that book, so... Uh, and it's independently published. I think I'm the only independently published novel in the best novel category this year. The Devoured and the Dead by Christopher Rufty, published by Death's Head Press. That is part of the Splatter Western uh, group of books. You know I'm a fan of Christopher Rufty's book. I just recently read Pillow Face here um, on the show. So The Devoured and the Dead by Christopher Rufty. That one is on the Splatterpunk Award nominee list. And I think he has a good shot at it, too. The Night Stalkers by Christopher Triana and Ryan Harding, published by The Evil Cookie Publishing. Uh, that one is actually on the list. That's coming up. I will eventually be reading that one on the show. Uh, Chris Triana and Ryan Harding are both legends in the game. They're beasts when it comes to the written word, so they definitely have a chance. I mean, everybody here has an awesome chance. Left to You by Daniel Volpe. That's my boy. Published by D&T Publishing. I've read Left to You, and it's an amazing book. It's a, it's a really, really good book. Uh, I think Daniel has a good shot at it. So, I mean, this that I mean, it's just a stacked category, man. All the categories are. Uh, best Novella, Midnight in the City of the Carrion Kid by James G. Carlson, published by Gloomhouse Publishing. I read, um, I can't remember the name of the book, but I read James G. Carlson's, I read one of his books here on the show. It was kind of like a sci-fi post-apocalyptic western, post-apocalyptic western kind of story that I read here on the show. If you guys remember, um, so I know he's an amazing writer too. I've heard great things about that book. Only the Stains Remain by Ross Jeffrey, published by Cemetery Gates Media. I haven't read Ross's work, but I think last year he had like two books. I think in the Splatter Punk, uh, I think the two books that were nominated. I think last year. So I know he puts out great work, and he has a lot of uh, a lot of fans, a lot of readers. Things have gotten worse since we last spoke by Eric LaRocca. That book has been, and, and published by Weird Punk Books, that book has been all over the place, all over social media. I haven't read it myself, but I know it's, it's, uh, it's a very popular book, and I've heard great things about it. That one was actually nominated for a, a, a Stoker Award. 
A Roll of the Dice by Matt Shaw that's independently published. Matt Shaw, everybody knows Matt Shaw. Um, we had him on the Written in Red po- podcast not too long ago. Roll of the Dice was, a, I believe that was like kind of like a choose-your-own. I think you rolled the dice to see what you were going to do in the book. So it was like an interactive book, I believe. And uh, I could be wrong, but I think that was the one that was interactive. And Matt Shaw is just, God, the guy, I think he has like fucking 500 books or something out there. The guy is is just a monster, man. He puts out so many damn books and so many good books. And, um, yeah, I mean, shit. I think he's been nominated pretty much every year for a Splatterfunk Award. Uh, Sacrament by Steve Stred, published by Black Void Publishing. Steve Stred is a really nice guy, too. I follow him on TikTok. I think that's the third book in his series that had something to do with the cult. And I think it's based on... I want to say, I'm not 100% sure on this, but I think he said that that was based on true experience. Like he either joined the cult or was or was looking into joining it or something like that for experience for the books. Some, something along those lines. I need to look into it myself because I remember I was really interested in it. And as I was grabbing the covers for this, I saw that it was the third book. So, um, But he's, he's really cool too. Uh, Talia by Daniel J. Volpe. So that's the second book he has in the Splatterpunks. So he's got one in novel and novella. So Talia by Daniel J. Volpe. Um, I know that's a super popular book too. That's independently published. Um, and like, you know, Daniel's a beast too, man. Best short story, The Martini Club by Aaron Beauregard. Aaron is also my boy. Aaron, everything that he writes is golden. Everybody loves Aaron. Um, and that's from his book, Beyond Reform, the one that he put together that was with John Athan and um, Jasper Bark. I think was I think it was John Athan and Jasper Bark. The three of them got, did that book together, and uh, so that short story, Martini Club, is from that book. Um, I think Aaron has an awesome shot at that one. Fireflies and Apple Pies by Thomas R. Clark, from The God Provides by Saint Rooster Books. Uh, Tommy Clark is awesome too. I love Tommy. Super cool dude. Um, one of the hosts of the Necrocasticon. Uh, podcast. He had me on his show. I met him at uh, at the Scares the Care Author Con. Just a great guy, man. I love Tommy. Sun Poison by Stephen Kozanowski um, from Battered Broken Bodies, which was independently published. That's the one that Matt Shaw put together. Um, I haven't read that story. Stephen is awesome, though. Really cool guy. Uh, I got to meet him also at Scares the Care Author Con, and we had him on the Written and Read podcast not too long ago. Um, just a really, really nice guy. Funny guy, too. I like Stephen a lot. In fact, he's on the wheel. I'll be reading from his book. Um, where is he? Billy and the Clonosaurus here pretty soon. Start Today by Justin Lutz from Teenage Grave, published by Filthy Loot. Abigail by Damon Manx. Damon is a really nice guy as well. Um, I've talked to him a few times. I know he's there. He's actually there at at uh, Killer. I almost said scares a care. He's at Killer Con as well. So I saw his post about eating tacos or something like that. So I wish him all the luck too. Um, Terror Tract Publishing put that book out. Uh, Next Best Baker by Jeff Strand. I'm a fan of Jeff Strand's work. I got to meet Jeff Strand at uh, Author Con, and that's from the Baker's Dozen anthology by put together by Uncomfortably Dark, which is Candace Nolis is a uh, Candace Nola's um, company, her her publishing company, and I'm actually in that anthology with him, and uh, I think he has a really good shot at that too. So, and Jeff is just a great guy, man. Uh, it was great to get to meet him in person finally, and and uh, he's just a gentleman. He's he's funny as hell too. Best collections. Beyond Reform, which is the one that I was mentioned before, that's John Athan, Aaron Beauregard, and Jasper Bark. Uh, AB Horror, Aaron Beauregard Horror put that together. Um, that one, I know that's a lot of people love that book. I think that has a really good shot at it. Black Tongue and Other Anomalies, I've seen that one around uh, TikTok a lot, put together by DNT Publishing. That's by Richard, sorry, The Black Tongue and Other Anomalies is by Richard Beauchamp published by DNT Publishing. That's the one I, I said I've seen around TikTok a lot. Sinister Mix by Brian Boyer. That's independently published. Brian Boyer is just, he's really cool. I've become pretty good friends with him, talking to him a lot on Twitter lately. But he's an amazing writer, and I messaged him to let him know that and stuff. So I think Brian, he was uh, nominated last year for something too. 
Shattered Skies by Chris Miller, um, put together by Death's Head Press. Uh, Chris Miller is a really nice guy, too. Um, I haven't got to meet him in person, but we've talked a few times. I like Chris a lot, and I've heard great things about that book as well. Twisted Tainted Tales by Janine Pipe by Pipe Screen Press. Uh, I love the cover for this book. I've always liked the cover for this one. As soon as I, I think I saw it first on Twitter, and it just drew my attention. I like how it looks like an eight, old 80s VHS. Um, I like it. And Janine's really active on Twitter and stuff. She seems really cool. I know she does a lot of interviews and stuff of some pretty big stars and stuff too. So, um, May Cause Ocular Bleeding by Nicholas P. Robinson. It's independently published. Nick is a good friend of mine. He's such a he's a sweetheart, man. Nick is just a, a really nice guy, man. Um, a gentleman, just a, a super cool dude. In fact, this book, I remember telling him I put a blurb together for him, and I can't remember the exact words for it, but I remember telling him I called him the uh, the Neil Gaiman of horror or something like that. After reading this book, just the the different stories that were in this book. I thought it was really cool. And then Best Anthology, I think, is the last category. Yeah. Body Shocks, edited by Ellen Datlow by, from Techion Publications. Um, I know Ellen puts great work together. I haven't read that book. Between a Spider's Eyes, edited by River Dixon, Potter's Grove Press. I think Aaron and Daniel are both in that one. I'm not sure if Roland is, but I think Aaron and Daniel are both in that one. Um... Bludgeon Tools, edited by K. Trap Jones, The Evil Cookie Publishing. I don't know. I somewhat. I can't remember who's in that one. I want to say. I, I I can't remember. I feel like somebody I know is in that one as well. Gorefest, edited by K. Trap Jones, Evil Cookie Publishing. I know Daniel was in that one. Um. Oh God, I don't have that one on. I don't have that one on me. I know Daniel's in that one. I think Aaron might even be in that one. That one had a lot of authors in it, well-known authors in it. Um, I just remember uh, Daniel m mentioning it on the show. And then Baker's Dozen, of course, by Candace Nola from Uncomfortably Dark. Um, that's the one that I'm in, Aaron's in, Daniel's in, Roland's in, Jeff Strand's in. There's a bunch of authors. Ruth Ann, Jake's in. Um, God, Chris Miller. There's a bunch of us in there. That uh, it's 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 uh, that was an awesome anthology, and then battered broken bodies edited by Matt Shaw had a lot of great authors in it as well, and that's independently published. So you can see all the categories are just stacked, man. This is gonna be insane. I wish I could be there in the room. I did put together a uh, a thank you speech. I mean, because you need to, you know, just in case. Like I said, I don't know what the odds are that the maddening will actually win, but. Uh, I have Roland ready to uh, accept it for me just in case. Um, so, yeah. I put together a pretty cool speech for him to read for me. <laughs> that I wish I could be there in case I win. But if I was there, I guess he wouldn't be the one reading it. I would be. So, anyways. But, alright. So, quickly, what I'm watching. I did finish The Handmaid's Tale. And now I'm in kind of like a show hangover. Because season four is done. It was awesome waiting on season five, um, and now I'm watching Love Island season four. I have to admit, I'm kind of a reality show junkie. Um, it's kind of a guilty pleasure, I guess. And with Love Island, at least you can kind of do other shit while it's on, because nothing really happens. It's all just stupid-ass flirting and stuff like that. And then they'll kick somebody off every once in a while, so at least it's kind of like dumb watching. You can do other shit while you're watching it. We are watching Stranger Things, and I know, don't give me any shit about it, all you Stranger Things fanatics. Um, I've tried to watch it like twice before, but I was always busy doing other things. Um, so Jules and I are watching it now, but we're only on episode like three, I think. And and we're very, very slowly watching it. So it's kind of like the show we watch if there's nothing else to watch. And I know it will pick up and we'll get into it more, but yeah, we are kind of watching it. I did watch Prey, the uh, Predator movie that came out on Hulu. I thought it was awesome. It was really good. Um, I watched that They Them movie that I said I wanted to see from on the last episode. Um, it was okay. It was all right. I thought it was kind of predictable. I, I knew who the killer was pretty quickly. Um, and the killer wasn't even in the movie all that often. 
it was it, like I said, it was just okay. Kevin Bacon was awesome as as usual. I love seeing these '80s actors that are still, you know, kicking. And I love seeing the '80s actors that aren't all so full of filler. You know what I mean? The ones that aren't jacking their their face up and everything with so much Botox and everything just to stay relevant. And you know what I mean? It's nice to see the ones that are just aging gracefully and accepting the roles that they can get. You know what I mean? But um, so Kevin Bacon, I think, is you know doing that, or you know, hell, so like Sylvester Stallone and stuff like that. Some of these man, they're starting to look kind of weird i don't know but um anyways all right as usual in the show i like to mention my newsletter carver spike carver spike carver pike dot substack dot com i like to throw that up there i get a few subscribers every once in a while and i have a feeling they might be coming from the show uh, i haven't put an, an, ep, uh, an episode i haven't put a an, an issue out recently not in a while, actually, but I told you that would happen. I, I don't put one out that often, but I do every once in a while, and I will soon. In fact, I'm uh, going on a little vacation with Jules um, this week just to get away for a little bit. We're going to go to the beach and just kind of do no work. So there will not be an episode of First Chapter Freak Show next week uh, because I'm not doing any work. I'm just taking my Kindle and swimsuit and we're just relaxing for a week with nothing else to do so that's the plan but anyways maybe i'll do some maybe i'll hand write a newsletter episode in a notebook or something like that just at you know my leisure anyways all right so let's move it on to the social media influencer the one i want to talk to today is a tiktoker it's a tiktoker she goes by her real name she goes by a, a page casting witch her name is Nikki. She's super cool. She's a tattoo artist who also um, create. She also makes jewelry and uh, stained glass art, and she's super active in the book world. Um, she has a ton of followers. She is great. I mean, she's just awesome at. She reads like at a ridiculous rate. I mean, and a lot of people ask her on her videos and stuff how she reads so fast, and she was explaining how she reads like. As she's any second she has, she reads walking. She reads just any spare minute she has. She just loves to read and stuff. And and she recently did a video. She does these videos kind of like this show in a way, actually. But she does these videos where she says she will convince you to buy a book just by um, reading like the beginning of it to you. And she picked a foreign evil, my first Diablo snuff book. Uh, as one of the books she did that one and she did another book so you'll see them both here in a second in this clip but she uh, read the book beginning of it on one of her clips on her uh, channel so I thought that was super cool so I wanted to give her a shout out and show her um, her clip and let you know tell you guys if you're on TikTok please go follow her let her know that I sent you um, to sh help show my appreciation uh, I think it's really cool what she does and yeah, I just wanted to share this, so check this out. I'm going to convince you to read these two books by reading you their first pages. Let's go. First up is A Foreign Evil by Carver Pike. Let me tell you about the night I experienced true evil. Nothing's been the same since. Mundane things like jogging through the park, watching Saturday afternoon matinees, and meeting internet hookups at coffee shops seem to have no place in the world once you've experienced the truly sinister circle of life, synchronized by Satan himself. Did I meet the devil? No, but he couldn't have been far away. His presence was painted on the night, slathered on a cosmopolitan canvas of corrupt con artists, sashaying hookers, and pissed off taxi drivers pressing palms against their horns at every woman they passed and every vehicle that blocked their paths. Next is You Must Not Miss by Katrina Leno. The smell of chlorine had always reminded Magpie Lewis of Summer, and Summer in turn reminded her of a much happier time, a time before her life had gone so completely wrong. Last summer, her sister had been home, her father had been discreet, her mother had been sober, and Magpie had spent three untouchable months on a pizza pool float in their small above-ground pool while her former best friend, Allison, had floated alongside her on a white swan. The swan was full of razor blade slashes now, and the pizza was deflated. When Magpie put her mouth on the pizza float's nozzle and blew, she tasted chemicals, sunscreen, sweat, regret. 
She pulled back and tried to spit away the taste. So, like I said, give her a follow if you're on TikTok. Check out her stuff. She's pretty cool. And um, I know we all horror authors appreciate what she's doing on there. Um, she really helps us all out by sharing our stuff like that. So let's move on. Um, I also have been reaching out to my group on Facebook, my um, Carver's Block group on Facebook, and having them give me horror books of the week. So um, this week I reached out to Donna A. Latham, who's also a horror author herself, and she helped me out uh, with this week's horror book. And um, so she's just a badass author herself, and she's really active in the book world. She's super cool. I got to hang out with her. Actually, Jules and I got to hang out with her and her friend Kim and a bunch of people, but we got to actually hang out with them and have a dinner and drinks and stuff like that at AuthorCon, so we got to know them really well, and, and uh, I don't know, Donna's just super cool. But I reached out to her, and she was really cool and helped me out with this one, and this is what she had to say. She said, My pick for Horror Book of the Week is Fur by Matthew Cash because it's heartbreaking and horrifying at the same time it's an unusual werewolf story about a group of elderly friends who discover the key to health and vitality but it comes with a price there's even a werewolf dotson i can never say that word that dog's name right dotson dotson oh, she told me the right way to say it and i still screwed up anyways what could be better than that the best werewolf story i've ever read all right, thank you, Donna. And if you don't know Donna, you definitely want to. She's such an active part of the indie horror author world. She's all over Facebook, and she's um, she's just, I mean, not only is she an awesome author, but she even just started a YouTube show with horror author Eric Butler. And they're both really good friends of mine. Trust me, they know their horror shit in and out. And their show is called What's in the Box Horror Episodes, I believe. Oh, Ho What's in the Box Episodes of Horror, where they do deep dives into horror. And um, they focus on books and movies and stuff like that. You definitely want to check them out. I've started checking them out. Uh, I believe they just have a couple episodes right now out. And um, I subscribed to them just recently, so you should too. And uh, see what they have to offer. And, you know, anyways, if you want to be a part of the horror book of the week and suggest something like that just join my facebook group carver's block you'll find the link to it down in the description below this video with all my other links um, inside of my group on facebook i have a pinned post where i asked if anybody uh, wants to join in that kind of thing and all you gotta do is go in there and comment and say you want to be a part of it and every week I go in there and usually I'm in a mad dash scrambling to find somebody to help me out because I tend to wait to the last second to do it. But I find somebody who's online at the moment and uh, ask them what they're reading, what they enjoy at the moment, what their horror book of the week is, what their pick is. And and uh, that's how we do it. So, yeah, check check out the group. It's it's pretty fun. I got to use it a little more often, but every once in a while I go live in there and kind of hang out with everybody, that kind of stuff. So, so yeah. But um, let's go ahead and ten turn the attention back to Edmund Stone because we've done a lot of shit during this episode. We've shown a lot of book covers, and we really need to turn the attention back to Edmund Stone. He is such a cool, genuine guy, humble. I've talked to him a lot of times. He's waited a very long time to get on the show, and he's been so cool about it. And um, it's his turn, so let's give him uh, the time he deserves, and let's uh, get the attention back on him. So I reached out to him, and I got his bio and he's given me lots of information. There's stuff going on with him, so let's talk a little bit about that. So Edmund Stone is a writer of horror, thrillers, and suspense, residing in a home along the Ohio River with his wife, three dogs, and a group group of mischievous cats. And his books can be found on Amazon. He gave me a bunch of links here, which I'm not going to read them all out because um, it's, it's links, so you really got to see them. So I will put all of those in the YouTube description below, as I always do. And um, just go and follow him on all those sites because, like I said, he's a really cool dude. And um, he's on TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. He's all over the place. He has a website at, uh, let me see, edmundstoneauthor.com where you can sign up for his newsletter and you even get a free story. And you can get all his latest information and all that kind of stuff, you know, about his new releases and that kind of stuff there. Um, let me see. What else? What does he have going on right now? 
He said he is set to be in the Fear Forge anthology that's due to come out on October 24th from Horror Smith Publishing. And the ebook is on pre order right now for only 99 cents. So I'm going to throw up the image of the cover of that book. I think the cover looks pretty cool. And he also sent me this really neat graphic that goes along with it. So check those out here on the screen. And, um, but most importantly, I think we should be talking about his Rebecca Mythos series because that's what we're reading from today. So we are actually reading the second book in the series, which is called The One. And that right now is free. The ebook is free right now on Amazon. So you can go grab the book I'm reading from today for free right now. I don't know how long he's keeping it for free. Um, it's one of those dope moments. I wish I'd asked him how long he's keeping it free, but I didn't. So hopefully you're watching this episode soon enough and you can go check it out and it will still be free. Um, the first book in the series called Tent Revival is 99 cents right now. So you can get the first and second book for a th what a, what would be what you can't even get a third of a cup of coffee at Starbucks right now for this for this price. I mean, you can get the first two books in a series for less than a dollar. I mean, even the even Dollar Tree doesn't sell stuff this cheap anymore. It's like a dollar twenty five an item now, and you could get two of his books that he put his so much effort into. I mean, imagine how much time he slaved away at a computer to write both of these books for less than what a, a, a spongy ball would cost at Family Dollar. I mean, a pack of Peeps, marshmallow bunnies cost more than that. You know what I mean? That's crazy. So, yeah, so that's what's going on right now. And this is all because book three is actually coming out on September 1st. And this is kind of an exclusive or not probably not really an exclusive because technically he's showing the cover tonight. Um, and my internet is so fucking slow that probably this episode won't even be uploaded in time before he shows it online anyways. But he's showing the cover for book three, which is called Lost Hope. So book three of the Rebecca Mythos, Lost Hope, um, is set to come out September 1st. He's showing the book cover tonight, he said online. And he gave me permission to show it here on my show. So technically, I'm putting it on my show first. Just my show probably won't air before he shows it anyways. So I could have had an exclusive if my internet was fast enough. That kind of sucks. So, but anyways, so check this cover out. I think it's pretty badass. And that's set to come out September 1st. He's going to be putting the pre-orders up next week, he said. So, um, or working on putting the pre-orders up next week. So hopefully he'll have those up. But technically you could have book one for 99 cents, book two for free, and all of this in time to get book three when he puts it up for pre-order so you could have the entire trilogy for that and jules just walked in you want to come over and say hi on my show you never said hi on my show before come over say hi come here i'm gonna pull you on i'm not live i'm pre-recording i'm gonna upload it here pretty soon but nobody knows this yet i actually already recorded all of this and my system crashed and i'm re-recording all of this so Aww. i'm really late Re yourself. I'm re-recording myself because I totally got Aww. fucked and I spent about half an hour doing this and there wasn't enough storage on my computer and it just crashed at the end. I can't read so it. I had to delete a bunch okay. of shit and redo it. So actually I have to pause because it turns out my wife is short and needs me to reach <gasps> something. <laughs> she didn't want me to say that loud but five five. hold on she's 5'5 five five, she wanted me to say which technically she's not. She's like 5'2". But I, one doctor let it slide and put on the paperwork that she's 5'5", five five, and now she won't it's, stop saying she's 5'5", five five because, it because it's documented now when she's technically like 5'2 and a half or something like that. Anyways, let me pause this, and I'm going to come right back. All right, so I'm back. I got what she needed down from the shelf because, um, you know, we don't want to make her climb, climb the shelves. <laughs> so there's your comic relief for the episode oh boy all right but at least i got through explaining all of edmund stone's upcoming books and stuff like that so anyways i have books one and two on my kindle and um and uh, i haven't read them yet but uh, i'm excited to read to get started on book two here so as i said a minute ago when i was talking to jules 
I've already done all this and it crashed, so I've actually read, it's pretty cool so far, what I've read of book two called The One. And I'm going to be rereading it here for this episode, so we're doing this here now. So, um, so yeah, anyways. All right, so you've seen the cover, and we're about to get started here. I need to read you the blurb now. As I said, this is the second book in the series, so the blurb is kind of spoilerish. It does kind of let you know a little bit of what happened, I guess, in book one, but um, I talked to the author, and he's cool with it. He said, you know, I... When you think about it, it's it's it just kind of it kind of whets your appetite and makes you want to read the first book anyway. So that's cool. So um, we're gonna go ahead and read the blurb for the book for the first. We're gonna read the blurb for the second book and get started reading. And um, hopefully that'll entice you, like I said, to pick up that ninety nine cent first book and the free second book, so you can get ready for the third one coming out. And uh, and and if you go look at his uh, author page. He's got quite a bit of work on his page, man. He's uh, he's put some work in, and uh, I think you might like what you see, so go check it out. But let's read this blurb real quick, all right? So here is the blurb for The One, Book Two of the Rebecca Mythos. It's been 13 years since the tent revival came to Salt Flat, Kentucky. The town has been devastated. Families have been torn apart and businesses closed. The place is only a former shell of itself. Cy Sutton has moved on, even though the events that night even though the events of that night left a scar on his heart. He never saw his son Alan after the revival. The boy and his grandpa, Sage, fought the ancient evil of Rebecca, destroying her with the spirits they conjured up. Cy fears his boy is dead and he'll never see him again. There is one shining light. He found his granddaughter living under state care as a Jane Doe. Now her name is Nikki. Sai, along with his wife, Patty, have raised her, protecting her from the events all those years ago. But soon the calm will be shattered. Rebecca and her generals weren't defeated. They were only weakened. With the help of the Pen Pendleton Corporation, she is hiding in a warehouse in Brooklyn, New York. She has a plan to return to Salt Flat and finish what she started. With the help of Samson, her closest general, she may accomplish it. But unknown to her or anyone else, an obstacle may stand in Rebecca's way, a force so strong not even the oldest magic can stop it, the fulfillment of an ancient prophecy, the coming of the One. Return to the town of Salt Flat for another ride into the magical and supernatural. Meet old friends and cringe as creatures bent on destruction fly above the regular world, and the common facade is not what it seems. This, the next book in the Rebecca Mythos, will have you mesmerized and turning page after page. All right. We're going to go ahead and get started reading from The One. Here we go. Start spreading the news. Go ahead and take my glasses off for this. You know, I'm fucking blind. The warehouse stood under the bridge, half in the eerie light of the street lamp and half out. The old brick facade crumbled onto the sidewalk below, and the windows were dark, giving the place an air of abandonment, a stark contrast to the lively renovated structures a few blocks away. Peter McNamara knew the area well, had been running goods from there since he was old enough to drive. His dad Carl had, too. Carl McNamara was once the best runner the Russian mob knew, trusted by all the bosses. Peter supposed he'd taken on the same mantra, picking up where his dad left off. But this job was different. The guy who set it up was surely no mob go-between. Charlie Shope had no pedigree at all, and he damn sure wasn't Russian. Just a slob in prison for running drugs, same as him. Peter figured he'd get this job done and be back in Brooklyn before sunset if all went well, and he didn't suspect there'd be any problems. He wasn't even using his own car. Nobody could trace him. Peter left the subway terminal and headed toward the water. It was a little chilly for an August night in New York, so he pulled his jacket snug around him. A couple of cops were parked on the corner. At least he figured they were cops, plain clothes, but they had the air of police surrounding them. He wondered what they were investigating, but decided not to do too much speculating. 
Peter only hoped it wasn't anything to do with people he, with the people he was meeting. They watched him suspiciously as he walked by, and he figured the color of his skin alone would bring on a search. Though his skin wasn't as dark as his dad's, Peter knew a man like him would be suspect walking down there alone at this time of night. He almost made it by before one of them called him over. Hey, buddy, can we talk to you? Peter thought about running, but it was better to keep his cool. They had nothing on him unless they were looking at his record as an ex-con. Could be, but he'd done his time and was clean. Nothing to be worried about. He nodded and walked toward the cops. One a tall white man standing next to the car, the other one sitting in the passenger seat with his laptop checking something. The tall man flashed a badge and began to speak. Named Smith, detective at the lower precinct. Me and my partner here are looking for someone. Big guy. Scary, with some breathing problems. Peter immediately took pause. The same guy he was looking for. Charlie had told him the man would be big and scary with an inhaler constantly in his hand. The kind of guy who looked like he walked straight out of some horror film. Nicely dressed, but would stand out in a crowd. Now the cops were looking for him, too. Maybe this wasn't a good job after all. The pay was too good to leave, but if it landed him back in jail before he could get back to his mob jobs, well, the family wouldn't be happy. They put too much into getting him out. No, ain't seen a thing. Just got here myself. Going to see some friends in one of the renovated warehouses around the corner. The ones they put the big loft apartments in. Detective Smith nodded. The passenger window eased down and the other cop, brown like Peter but much more clean in appearance, cleared his throat. Says here you just got out of prison. Running drugs for the Reznikov family. You wouldn't be setting up something like that again, would you? Maybe the guy we're looking for has something to do with it? Peter smiled. No, oh, man, I'm clean. Did the time and ready to be done with it. Like I said, I'm meeting some friends around the corner. I suppose if we followed you there, your story would check out? Detective Smith asked. Okay, it might be time to run. But no, he'd be a suspect for sure then. They could frisk him if they wanted, but they'd find nothing. Peter didn't keep a gun with him, only went on a run. Charlie had told him the guy he was working for would provide one in the car so he didn't need to worry about anything. Yeah, it would. It, yeah, it would. Just some friends. Smith looked him over, then turned to his partner and nodded. The window closed and an eerie silence pervaded. The cops seemed to be assessing the situation, see if his story checked out or if they should investigate further, Peter assumed. All right. I'm going to take your word for it. We'll be checking on you, though, Smith said, smiling smugly. If you see anything, give us a call. The man produced a card from his pocket with his name and number. <coughs> Peter scanned it. Officer William Smith, Lower Precinct, Special Victims Unit. Peter looked back at him. SVU? Like on TV, huh? Yeah, but this ain't make-believe down here. A lot of people have gone missing lately, and we're trying to find out the cause. Seems like the man I described is near every scene. He's a person of interest. We just need to talk to him. Got it. I'll be on the lookout. You do that. Smith got back in the car. The engine fired up, and the vehicle eased out, disappearing around the corner. Damn. The cops were on to the guy he was supposed to meet. Charlie told him the guy was clean. Nobody knew him. Now, right before Peter was set to go, to go to the warehouse, he finds the guys wanted for questioning. It all had a bad vibe. But the money they were paying would get him back in business and get him a gun and a car to boot. He thought back on the conversation he and Charlie had when they were cellmates. Peter didn't like the guy at first, but endured him for a few months, and he got more tolerable as time went on. Charlie had been telling him about a job Pete would be perfect for. Hey, Pete, need a smoke? No, I'm good. Been thinking about the job you told me about. You sure it's a good one? My people wouldn't be too happy if I ended up back here just as I got out. They pay cops off and all, but these people you talk about sound like they don't have any connections. Oh, no, they're connected, all right. Ever hear of the Pendleton Corporation? Yeah, who hasn't? 
Hold on. <laughs> Sorry. Phone call. Man, this episode... This one has just been a rough one, man. Edmund, we're going to get through your book, man. This is your episode. I promised you. And we are going to do it. God, it's been a lot of interruptions in this one, though. That's for sure. All right. So let's get back to this. Oh, no. They're connected. All right. Ever hear the Pendleton Corporation? Yeah, who hasn't? Well, word has it they're elbows deep with the group, and I believe it. I should be out of here soon, and I'll be running for them too. The big guy the big guy said so. They'll pay you at least a hundred grand to run this job alone. Peter thought about this. The sum was more than he made in twenty jobs with the mob, but he had a nagging feeling this was all too good to be true. The big guy sounds like sounds a little cliche. He got a name? He goes by Samson, and once you see him, you'll know why. Looks like a white Shaquille O'Neal. That big, huh? Every bit of it. Scary, too. Sucking on his, his inhaler like a pacifier. Inhaler? Is he sick or something? Not sure. He seems to be okay, but I don't know. All I know is they pay well, and I'm sure you could use the cash once you're out of here. You're right about that. When you take a fall, you lose all your standing for a bit. They get you back into the game as soon as they can, but it's hard to make ends meet at first. With the parole officer hanging on my tail, I'll have a tough time getting by. My, my family will want me to hang low for a little while. I'll have to figure out a way to ditch the ankle monitor. Shouldn't be too, much, too tough, though. Won't be the first time I've done such a thing. Charlie nodded. Good. You know anything about where this guy's from? Peter asked. I think it was Baltimore at one time, but he's been all over. Kentucky, I think, was the last place. Really? Must be involved in drugs. The family runs shipments that way all the time. It was then they heard a gruff-sounding voice in the cell next to them. Some hillbilly they'd tried to avoid. He was old and in for murder. Nobody thought much of him. You all talking about Kentucky? A big man? Probably Salt Flat. It's where all the weird shit happens. Charlie shook his head and spoke to the old man. The fuck you talking about, you crazy old kook? I know the place, and I know the big guy was the one took my son, Buck. I heard through the grapevine he was all over the town before my, my boy had disappeared, along with half the town itself. The last time I talked to him, before they put me up here, I tried to warn him to stay away, but he fell in with them just the same. I work the mines there, and I know all about the crazy-ass shit goes on there. Peter nudged Charlie, tilting his head sideways, then expressing clearly how much he thought the old guy was full of shit. Well, old man, Kentucky's a long ways from here, so you don't need to worry about it. Mind your own business. You all are the crazy ones. I'm as sane as anyone. They some bad dealings going on there, and now they's here. I want my boy to come visit me. I shouldn't be here. Whatever's in that mine should be burned, the man droned. The last thing Peter remembered were the guards coming in and taking the old man, dragging and kicking to the hold. Good riddance, Peter thought. The next few days he and Charlie discussed where to meet and what to say when he got there, but he said nothing of the cops looking for the guy. Yet here he was, and there was no turning back now. He walked on, stopping at the chain-link fence surrounding the place. A sign hung from the front of the fence, the Pendleton Corporation and Holdings. A guard sat in a shack just beyond the entrance. When he noticed Peter standing there, he pushed a button, and a large gate began to roll to the side, jerking slightly with each hum of the motor. Peter walked uneasily through the gate. The guard nodded as he went by. Just beyond the shack, a large man stood beside a black Cadillac. He was just as big and intimidating as Charlie said and as he stepped toward Peter, he puffed an inhaler, releasing it from his lips with a peculiar popping sound. You must be Peter. My name's Samson. Charlie told me all about you. I think you'll make a welcome addition to our clan. Pleased to meet you, but I'm only here for the one job. My family wouldn't be too happy if they knew I was here, so let's keep it on the down low, if you know what I mean. If you mean the Reznikov family, I assure you, they will do nothing to interfere. Mr. Pendleton pays them handsomely for their protection in this area of the city. Peter gave him a surprised look, 
how did he know the family, or that Peter was involved with them? I assure you, Mr. McNamara, you have nothing to worry about. Now let's get you set. The car is to your liking. Peter looked at the beast before him. It was an older model Cadillac Fleetwood, the kind you'd see in a parade or something. Peter thought the mayor rode around in one. Either way, it was a sweet old ride. Blend blending in wouldn't be easy, but it would get him to his destination fast and in style. He ran his hand down the side and tried to look through the driver's side window, but saw only his reflection staring back at him. The window tint was too dark to be legal. Maybe a good thing. Nice car, but I doubt I'll get far before the cops get suspicious and want to pull me over. I can tell you, if they do, I'll be going straight to jail. Man who looks like me can't be seen driving something like something this nice. You can call me Pete, by the way. I think Mr. McNamara is more appropriate. Peter gave him a strange look. What was with all the formality? Suit yourself. You'll have no problems at all, Mr. McNamara. You can drive with confidence, knowing all is taken care of. Peter stared at the car, then to Samson, before he spoke. You get the piece I asked for? If you're referring to the gun, then yes, it's inside of the front seat. I hope it's to your liking. Peter opened the door and looked inside. On the leather seat lay a short-barreled Remington pump shotgun with an assortment of shells. Just what the doctor ordered, he thought. A briefcase sat beside it. What's in the case? Why, the money we're paying for the job, of course. You can check it if you like. I'm sure you'll be satisfied. Peter reached for the case, bringing it closer to him, then unsnapped the clasps. Stacks of $100 bills lined the entire thing. Charlie wasn't lying. These people meant business. Shall we go over the details of the job? Peter slid the case across the seat to the other side, then stood to look at Samson. Let's do it. Okay, then. Come into my office. What about the money? Will it be safe in there? The car takes what I tell it to and protects it. The car takes what I tell it to and protects it. Anyone or anything not authorized to be there will meet with some dire circumstances. Peter nodded. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Jeez. Must be some kind of high-tech security system protecting the car, he thought. Smart move with the kind of money floating around in the case. He followed Samson to an office across the parking lot. Once they entered, Samson directed him to a chair on the other side of the big desk. I have the directions here. He pushed an old-school atlas map toward him. Peter smiled at the thing. What? No GPS? No. Too easy to track. Peter looked at him thoughtfully. Makes sense, I guess. He studied the map. A drawn line led to an area in South New Jersey, ending in a star sticker attached to a small town or maybe just an area off the road. Another line led from it across Pennsylvania, through Maryland, and into West Virginia. It finally stopped in eastern Kentucky. This looks crazy. So I'm going to Jersey, then taking a detour to bumfuck Egypt? Samson looked puzzled. No, you're not going overseas. There is no ship involved. Peter shook his head. Never mind. Why Kentucky? The big man smiled. The shipment you'll be delivering is in New Jersey. It will be taken to Kentucky. Peter studied the map again. This could be some serious downtime away from the people who would surely be looking for him. The parole officer, for one. If he just disappeared, wouldn't they come after him? Even without the ankle monitor he ditched, they could still find ways to track his whereabouts. But the money, that was some serious cash to consider. All right, but what about my parole? I have a parole officer, and they'll be coming after me if I jump before time's up, even without the ankle bracelet. Samson sat back in the chair, then pulled an inhaler from his pocket. The large man pushed the plunger and breathed in. It popped as he released it from his mouth. Peter thought the man looked like a large balloon ready to blow at any time. Samson let out a sigh. Don't worry about the authorities. You've been incarcerated for far too long. All is taken care of, including your parole. Peter wondered how far a reach these people had. If they were tied up with the Pendleton Corporation, must be very connected. 
The whole thing was crazy but profitable. He shook his head. I guess I'm in then. When do I start? Why, Mr. McNamara, right now, as soon as we leave this room. Peter gave him an incredulous look. Now? I haven't even had time to visit my mama since I've been out. There will be time for those things later. Give her a call in the meantime. I provided a cell phone for you. Make the call on there. It's completely untraceable. There's also a credit card with it to pay for any travel expenses. He thought of the way his mama would worry, but she did live in a senior apartment with nurses and other people to take care of her. He wouldn't need to worry too much. The whole job would only take a few days at best. Besides, the money they were paying would more than take care of any continued care, care expenses he'd need to pay for. Let's go, then. Splendid. I knew you were the man for the job. Charlie told me all about you. Peter wondered how much Charlie had told the man. They were bunkmates for a while. The man insisted he'd be with Peter, even when the guards came in trying to move him. Peter thought it was because Charlie didn't want to be somebody's boy, but it, just, but it seemed to be more than that. He had a genuine interest in Peter, and now he saw why. Samson stood and extended a hand to Peter, and they shook. Peter could feel the man's strong grip and thought he would be tough in a fight, but there was something else there as well. Peter could feel the skin on the man's palm rippling like little waves of energy. The man was a strange cat indeed, but Peter had met his fair share of them. If he could provide the protection he promised, then this would be an easy job. Although, with all the experiences Peter had in the past ten years, he'd come to realize nothing was easy. Samson released his hand and led him to the door. They left the building and headed for the Cadillac before noticing an argument ensuing by the gate. The two cops Peter had seen earlier were talking to the guard. When they saw Samson, they began yelling, Police! Stop where you are! Peter took a step back. He would need to make a run for it, and the office wasn't too far. If the cops were able to squeeze off around, he could still make it unscathed. Maybe, anyway. But before he could bolt, Samson stopped him. Don't worry, my friend. They won't apprehend you. I have it all taken care of. Go to the car and get in. Drive away toward the coordinates I gave you on the map. No one will pursue, I assure you. The big man lumbered toward the officers. The guard stepped inside the shack to clear the way for Samson, and the cops stared at each other nervously, pulling their sidearms from the shoulder holsters under their jackets. I said stop. This is your last warning. We have a warrant for your arrest in connection with the disappearances of multiple people. We want to take you to the precinct for questioning. Gentlemen, we can talk here. I have nothing to hide. Peter watched as Samson herded the cops to the side, the two backing away, guns still drawn. No better time than the present to get out of here. Peter opened the door to the car and jumped into the driver's seat. One of the cops noticed him trying to leave and started yelling. Son, stay where you are. Nobody leaves until I tell them to. Peter paid no attention, closing the door behind him and shutting out the conversation. He heard the sound of guns firing, muffled from inside the car. Peter fired up the engine and the car came to life. The rumble of power roared beneath him, all eight cylinders. The gate opened, but the cop's car was parked across the entrance. No time to politely ask them to move. Peter dropped the car into drive and pushed the accelerator. The car lunged forward, clearing the gate and smacking into the back fender of the cop's car. The force turned the car sideways enough for Peter to maneuver the Cadillac into the street. He stopped for a moment and looked into the rear view. Samson had the cops in some kind of strange hold. They looked like marionette puppets the way they were moving, blood pouring down one's face in the fearful stare of a man who knew he was going to die. No time to worry about it now. He watched enough mob hits to know the cops didn't have a chance. They'd probably never be seen again. Peter stepped onto the accelerator and drove. He'd need to be extra vigilant. If the cops had managed to get a radio message out, a fact he highly doubted, they'd be up ahead looking for him. It didn't matter, though. He had a job to do, and it was just getting started. All right, that's the end of the first chapter. That was an awesome beginning, man. Edmund, that was really cool. See, now I got to read book one because I don't I need to know more about this Samson character. That was pretty crazy. That was wild, man. Thank you, Edmund. Thank you for trusting me with your word. Every words, everybody go check out Edmund's books. I'm telling you, grab book one for 99 cents. Grab the one I just read for free and get ready for the third book. 
thank you again for trusting me with your words, man. That was really cool. So, um, and thank you for being patient, waiting for your book to be read on the show. Uh, remember, all of Edmund Stone's um, details will be down in the YouTube description below the video, as will mine. So go check out all of his work, and please check out mine as well. Um, you know, usually at this point, I would spin the wheel, find out who we're reading from next, but we're still just at we're still just erasing the old names and adding new names. So in the next episode, I will be reading from Dead by Morning by Kayla Krantz. Dead by, Dead by Morning by Kayla Krantz will be our next read in the next episode. Remember, I won't be doing a show next week because I'll be on vacation, but the following week, hopefully when I'm back, I'll be able to get back into the swing of things, and I'll be reading from Kayla Krantz's book, Dead by Morning. And replacing her on the wheel will be Justin Boots, the Undead Possession series, book one, Infestation. Uh, Justin is a really cool dude. I'm glad to finally get his book off the list and get it put on the wheel, so Justin Boots... The Undead Possession series, book one, Infestation, will take the place of Dead by Morning by Kayla Krantz on the wheel. All right, lastly, before signing off, I want to say thank you to Wooford Lee Jones for the review that he did on Redgrave. Um, Redgrave is an older book of mine, Military Horror, and he did an amazing review that um, was just awesome. I'm going to put that up as the music plays uh, at the end of the show, so please review that. Um, he took the time to write this awesome review. He even put it in his newsletter. Um, so please check out his website, Wooford Lee Jones, W O F F O R D L E E Jones dot com. Um, that's where you can sign up for his newsletter. But you can see the review and everything there in his his newsletter, I believe. And you can see it as the show plays out. Please read his review and um, you know. Go show him some some support and help me show my appreciation. Thank you, Wolford. I really appreciate it, man. And as usual, if you want your book to be read on the show, please reach out to me at carverpike at gmail.com or on social media. and We'll get you on the list that will eventually get you on the wheel. And if you like horror, anything uh, indie horror, if you're into the indie horror book world, if you're an aspiring horror author that kind of thing. You also probably want to check out the Written and Read podcast that I do that I'm a co-host with Aaron Beauregard, Daniel J. Volpe, and Roland Bercy Jr. Um, check out that show. That's on YouTube. And the podcast version is pretty much anywhere that you listen to podcasts. And um, I think that's about it. Check out all the previous episodes, and I will see you next time. Thank you for watching. <laughs>